Hello, and welcome to the East Africa Business Podcast. I'm Sam Ploy, and I'm here on the continent to learn about the emerging business scene. I'll be interviewing startups, investors, and organizations who are all playing their part in helping the region develop and grow. And in doing this podcast, I'll be sharing with you the things I learned along the way. If you don't have much money, there are lots of things that you can't buy. This might sound simplistic, but in a country where a high proportion of the population have low income, it means that as a manufacturer of products, there is a huge number of people who you can't access, unless you could just give it to them and have them pay it back to you over time. This is the opportunity that Angarda has seen, and they have developed a software platform to allow manufacturers to switch off devices if credit payments aren't paid. Doing so puts the products in the hands of people who otherwise couldn't afford it. Lindsay is the head of the Africa office, and we discuss the history of the company, considerations for giving products on credit, and applying their technology to a range of different products. It's also similar, but different, to Bbox, who featured in an early episode called Solar Systems. You might be interested in listening to that one too. For now though, I do hope you enjoy the interview with Lindsay. So I'm here with Lindsay from Angaza. Uh, Lindsay, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Cool. So just to get us started, can you tell us a bit about you and a bit about what Angaza does? Sure, yeah. As you said, my name is Lindsay Caldwell. I've been with Angaza for a little more than a year now, but in working in and around Kenya and Ethiopia for just about the last five years. So I came to Angaza from a sort of rural services background, having worked with an organization that did rural distribution, which was really exciting for me because the job with Angaza was a nice marriage of things that I'd already worked on, things like repayment, solar distribution and services for the rural poor. And Angaza, which you probably don't know, but I'll explain about it, is a really cool company focused specifically on pay as you go. So what does pay as you go mean? Because a lot of people don't know what that is. It's essentially how can we provide products on credit? So essentially the sort of challenge that Angaza is specifically trying to address is the fact that while there are incredible solar products available, they're often too expensive for individuals to buy outright. So the next step in that is being able to offer credit. So how can we reduce the upfront cost and then allow people to pay over time to eventually own these solar products? And Angaza started out actually as a pay-as-you-go solar company. So our first product was called the Solite. And the idea was to actually have people pay for these products on credit and use a technology platform to communicate those payments. Eventually, uh, in 2014, we sort of pivoted the focus of the company and specifically decided that there were plenty of solar manufacturers making incredible products and how could we help the market? And the way that we as a company could help the market is to create awesome pay-as-you-go products and then a software platform and an app that helps support the distributors distributing those products. So what do we look like now? (laughs) So now we're a software platform and an app, as well as a devices team that specifically focuses on manufacturers. So we basically partner with manufacturers and with distributors. So on the manufacturing side, we're specifically working with manufacturers to create these pay-as-you-go solar lanterns or solar home systems. And when we say pay-as-you-go solar lanterns, what we mean is that when you don't pay, the unit locks you out. So essentially, you pay to use your product until you own it, and then the locking mechanism no longer works, and you can use the the product anytime without having to make a payment. So on the manufacturing side, we're helping distributors that maybe, sorry, manufacturers that have traditionally only made uh, products for sale to help create products for credit. And then from the office where I sit, the East Africa office, we're specifically focused on partnering with distributors to help them actually utilize these products in the field. So we provide all the support services around ensuring that these products reach the end user and that they're effective and that uh, distributors understand how to create a really strong credit model such that they're reaching tons of end users and end users paying well for these products and actually own them. Got it. So you basically have um, this sort of web, you always have a web platform and you've got so two two types of customers: these manufacturers and the distributors. What in rough numbers? What have you got of each? Yeah, so we're working right now with five to six manufacturers, and a lot more in the pipeline, which we don't publicly talk about yet. And then on the distribution side, we're working with just about thirty partners. 
uh, which is over 25,000 loans being supported through the platform. Cool. And, uh, and which is easier to get? Is it easier to get a distributor or a manufacturer? <laughs> I, I would say it's equally difficult, but for different reasons. Um, I think there are a lot more existing solar distributors. Uh, so that's a much more competitive market uh, than necessarily manufacturing. So on the manufacturing side, it's about ensuring that we're getting to the right manufacturers who have passed the global lighting standards and who hopefully already have experience developing products for a developing market. So that's who we're hunting down on the marketing side or manufacturing side. And then on the distribution side, trying to figure out how to work with both small uh, distributors who may be only able to finance products every few months and then also working with these large, more experienced distributors who you know, follow all kinds of profiles, whether that's MFIs, companies that do great distribution but have never worked in solar before, companies that have done only cash sales for solar but need to transition because they can reach a broader market by using pay as you go. Yes, I was about to say, so is your main sell to both of these customers that uh, traditionally, if you require cash upfront, you've only got X percent of the market. If you can suddenly open up to credit, you've then got why have wipe percent of the market? Absolutely. I, the sort of single biggest reason people even come to us is that exactly that. They realize that they only get so far with their current model and that they recognize that credit is an important piece of the solar industry. And so in the Kenyan market, what percent, you know, how, how much bigger can the market be made by doing this, this type of approach? I think, well, I was going to say, just to say that it's what 80% of the Kenyan market lives off grid. So that's already a huge target market. And then the percent of that that falls below the poverty line is the majority. So I, I think basically everybody becomes a customer when it's pay as you go, which is to say that that would not be the case with cash and carry. Sure. So, so in a credit model, you're saying that almost anyone can, can enter in? Yes. Uh, depending on the product, obviously, and the price point, and then this sort of sets of payments. So, but yes, I, I think anybody could be a customer for a pay-as-you-go product. And so with the, the Angaza software, is that used in, in lots of products or have you, have you just sort of focused on a few product types? Yeah, right now we're working on expanding our full range. So we started out working specifically with a small half-watt lantern and now are in lanterns, multifunction lanterns and solar home systems and are just now building a prototype for a water pump and we'll also be working hopefully one day with cook stoves and other products. So we're across the lighting board right now when it comes to lanterns, uh, small solar home systems and then hopefully expanding onward to other products. And if I'm right, you said that a bit of the tech involved was this ability to switch it off if people have yeah, but I've sort of stop paying. Can you talk a bit about how that works? Yeah, so basically there is a switch within the product that cuts off the collection of energy from the sun uh, to the product, to the product's battery. So essentially the way it works, and I'm obviously not an engineer by the way that I'm describing this, but the way that it works is our system through many different technologies. So we work with a broad range of technologies that help control this. But essentially, whether it's through a what we call a cable technology, a Bluetooth technology, a Kiko technology, or a GSM technology, are able to communicate directly with the device to let it know how much has been paid and how much time should be added and when it should stop working. So essentially, there's a coprocessor inside the product that communicates with our back end, either through a cell phone, as we were saying, through GSM or through a key code that essentially resets this clock inside of the product to reflect the amount paid and the time purchased for usage. And is this what you are working on with the manufacturers when you say that you're kind of looking to, is that, is that why it's quite a deep partnership with the manufacturers? Yeah, so I think it depends on the manufacturer how much we are involved in their manufacturing process. So if they have a really strong hardware engineer and software engineers, it can be a lot uh, more of an independent relationship where they're simply paying to use our firmware and hardware library. Other times, if it's more custom work, we're actually helping to build a prototype with them um, to actually make uh, this specific product pay as you go. And then in some cases, um, we also have our own coprocessor that can be slotted into their manufacturing process as well. So our devices team has been working really hard to find a diverse way of making sure that manufacturers can feel comfortable making a pay-as-you-go product. Awesome. And so how do you make money? Those parties pay us licensing fees. Um, <laughs> so in our case, 
on the manufacturing side, manufacturers are paying uh, for this joint relationship for creating their pay as you go line. So there's a down payment fee, a licensing fee for that, plus an ongoing fee for the first year of manufacturing. And then just depending on how many types of technology they're integrating into their product line, that would change the fee slightly. And then on the distribution side, our distributors pay what we call a bundle pricing fee, which is essentially a, an Angaza fee, combined, an fee combined with the product price to the manufacturer. So if I'm the distributor, I would get billed by the manufacturer for the price of the goods that I'm purchasing plus Angaza services, pay that, and then um, Angaza would subsequently bill the manufacturer. Before Angaza, were there any other companies that were looking to open up the market by credit payments? There are lots of companies excited about credit, and I think the partnerships have been different. So I think, especially in East Africa, especially, MFIs have... So M- M- MFI is... Uh, microfinance institutions have long played a role in providing uh, small loans to rural communities and developing communities. So basically, I think the idea of credit has been there for a very long time. So when we're talking about the involvement of microfinance institutions, we're talking about essentially these, uh, I keep diverting to MFIs because I'm used to saying that, but basically these MFIs providing uh, loans to, to end users, what we would consider to be an end user. And then that person could use the cash that they're receiving from the MFI to purchase a solar product. And then instead of paying back the distributor, they're paying back the MFI for that loan. So there's long been a history of credit. It was more about how do we do this effectively, I think is the question that Angas is really answering, which is to say a pen and a paper and tons of clients, it's extremely hard to track how much you've collected, what people still owe, and managing that process along with the fact that when people make a payment, the product works when people don't pay you, the product works, creates less incentive for someone to feel like they have to pay and feel urgency around payment. And so did you, in your research, did you see that that being a problem? Was it that people would, they would get this, they would get, let's say, their lantern on an MFI agreement and then they just stop paying? Potentially, yes. And I think it really depends. So (laughs) it really depends. So some distributors we talk to decided to do their own credit model uh, using pen and paper or some sort of Excel sheet, and that wasn't working for them. It was extremely hard to track, especially tracking cash as well. So there's, I think, two layers to it, right? There's systems around how to track you know, progress on the loan, who you're loaning to, and then also tracking where your cash is as it moves from the end user to the person who's doing the collecting and then back to centrally to the organization. And so what Gaza really saw was a need for software as well as this hardware to work together and we weren't the first ones to develop the lockout software and hardware that was certainly being done by other companies where Gaza stands out is both how we fit into the space uh, in terms of partnering with manufacturers and partnering with distributors rather than creating our own solar products and distribution network so working to leverage existing networks and then i think also uh, where we're you know, very unique is uh, introducing technology that can make small lanterns pay as you go. So typically for a lot of the existing pay as you go companies, they only do that in a solar home system size. So what Agaza has done is created our own proprietary um, system called cable technology that you can use. It's uh, much less expensive than GSM or key code. And so G- GSM? Yeah, so GSM essentially uses, GSM essentially allows us to connect remotely to a solar home system and turn it on and off. Okay. So if you imagine a system that's, uh, you know, I would, I would say almost smart, such that it doesn't need any human touch to enter uh, key codes or in any way top up the unit each time it's been paid, our system can automatically connect to it and uh, enter in the next key code such that it's topped up. Uh, when somebody makes a payment. Sure. So we that technology in and of itself can run anywhere from you know twenty five to forty dollars in addition to the cost of manufacturing. So it's extremely expensive technology which you wouldn't want to put into a ten dollar lantern. But Angaza was able to develop a technology that you can use with a small half watt lantern.
and they get pay as you go. Nice. And um, you hinted on it. Um, so you said in the MFI agreement, people would be paying with cash. Are they paying cash with Angaza? We actually have a mix of customers. For most of East Africa, uh, companies are trying to utilize mobile money. And one of the services that Angaza can also offer is integration uh, with mobile money providers. So we have an integration specialist who specifically focuses on being able to alert our system when a mobile money payment has been received by one of our distribution partners. So we can take and pay set for an example. Lots of people are familiar with pay bill accounts. So a distribution partner would set up a pay bill account and clients would make payments directly to the distributor to pay for their products. And each time one of those payments is received, Angaza also gets notified so that our system can update the status of that customer's loan. And then also depending on the pay-as-you-go technology that's being utilized, uh, provide feedback. Maybe it's a key code if it's a key code client or it updates an agent's phone such that they can top up the unit uh, using a cable or a Bluetooth connection, or if it's GSM paying the system directly to let it know that it, it has received additional time. Nice. Since you uh, started working here, or since Angaza has started, what have been the main challenges that you faced? Yeah, I mean, I think when I first started, we were working with just one product. So we were only partnering for a half lot lantern. And now we've diversified across multiple technologies and multiple products, which means there's increased complexity on making sure that each distributor is working with the right mix of products and technology for the distribution network that they have. So I think that's one challenge. I think the second challenge is that as a horizontally integrated company in this space, we have you know, direct customer support and direct recruitment of distributors, but ultimately we don't have to do the hard work of actually distributing these products. And so we're relying on our partners to be incredibly good at getting these products to the end user, messaging them well, and then creating an environment for individuals to pay well too. So I think that's a big concern for us is that we, we can't go down and distribute. So instead, all we can do is help to coach our partners on how to do credit well. And I think that's you know, sort of an interesting piece of all of this is that pay-as-you-go is still a really, really new space. People are developing a lot of different models around how to do this effectively and essentially writing the playbook on being a good pay-as-you-go distributor at the same time as everybody is doing it. So it's not one of those businesses somebody gets into and says, great, here's the playbook of how to do this well. I know how to set up my business. I can do this effectively. And we're going to get tons of clients and we're going to get really strong repayment. So the Gaza office here in East Africa has really been set up on how to coach and share best practices because of where we sit working with so many partners uh, to try and help create this playbook around how to do this type of work effectively. So what are the, the other ways that you could be doing it? Uh, okay, so you mean for like how to, to distribute on credit? Well, you, you, you're sort of saying how you know, you're know you kind of still figuring it out yourself, but there's lots of people doing, doing it in other ways. Yeah. What, what are some of the other ways that you could be? So not different ways from us, but all of our partners utilize different models. So people can de-risk their business in different ways. So maybe they have their agents paying for their products outright before they ever sell them to an end user. So the distribution network is paid off for the product, regardless of the credit that's being extended down to the end user. There are companies that take all the risk all the way to the end user, but are using a network of third-party agents. So they're relying on existing networks like self-help groups or maybe partnering again with a microfinance institution to help do the distribution. There are models that rely on a really fantastic sales agent and then a call center to do the follow-up for payment, presuming that the product itself you know, is something that everyone desires and will use every day and wants to pay for. So I think you can sort of set up your distribution network in a number of different ways, but with the understanding that uh, in a pay-as-you-go business, it's not just about getting the initial sale. You're creating a long-term relationship with this person which I always say client instead of a buyer because you know I think of client relationship as being something that you're essentially cultivating for the length of the loan. So maybe that's six months or three months for some of the smaller lanterns or a year to two years with larger systems. So you have to continue to encourage this person to pay you back to recoup costs on all these products that you now get in loans on, which is a hugely different 
way of approaching you know traditional solar distribution networks that were doing cash and carry and are most people paying back yes i think what changes is the expected length of time so people are paying back i think that's been the pattern but that sometimes it's much longer than the payment period a distributor has set out for their clients. So maybe you said they would pay in six months, they actually do pay, but it takes them you know, a year to a year and a half to pay off the, the, the full value of the loan. And why does it take longer? I think there are a lot of factors that go into that. I think it can be if it's not the right product match with the right community. So if you're, you know, let's say you're selling a small lantern to a community that mostly has, we can say undergrid, so they have some access to electricity, uh, they may not even notice when their solar product is shut off because they're not using it that often. So they're only paying at the point at which they actually need the lantern, maybe when this electricity that's provided in their community shuts off. Or you've sold a much larger system to someone who can't afford it, so they've defaulted on their payments for a, a certain period of time. So I think those are factors and why the loan period could be much longer than you've expected, either because people aren't paying attention to the payment or because they don't have the money to actually pay. And then I think you know there are other elements that go into this well, which is how did you decide on the length of your loan period in the first place? Is it really reflective of the income? and the cash flows of the community that you're actually offering it to, or was it a guess and now you've learned that actually the loan takes a lot longer than you expected. And I think also sort of beyond that, there's this synergy between sort of the finances of the person you're lending to, the type of product you're lending, and then the explanation of the loan that you've extended. And I think pay as you go is going through this change where you know the name pay as you go implies pay when you have money and actually a lot of distributors are not doing traditional pay as you go that's not meant to be a loan whereby you just pay when you have money and you don't pay when you don't it's meant to be a fixed term loan in which there are either you know reward for paying early or consequences for paying late and it models much more of a traditional loan than people might expect and so I think there's also a messaging element to all of this, which is how did you message what your loan is? What is your product loan? What does it look like? I'm trying to say, have you come up with any good alternatives? Because <laughs> because you're right. Because pay as you go, just it sounds it sounds very nice. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's quite an easy thing to say. <laughs> I don't know. Fixed term payment seems a bit yeah. Are there any that you you come close to getting? Yeah, I mean, I <laughs> I think it's an industry where we're going to stay with pay as you go, but um. I think some have talked about a product loan, uh, marketing, uh, we're offering a product loan for six months and you pay installments of X amount each month. I Some call it a lockout system <laughs> and instead of pay as you go, so lock, you get locked out when you don't pay. I, I think it's mostly, <laughs> I, I think mostly like a, a, a product loan makes sense to people. So you're with you know seven easy payments of uh, 400 shillings you're going to own this product okay. is an easy way of looking at it. And are they typically, I'm just talking about product loan, do you communicate in English? Yeah, great question. <laughs> <laughs> so we're working in almost 15 countries now and it's actually been a really interesting piece of uh, the business, which is to say a lot of the founders are uh, fluent in English, if not native English speakers. So it's really easy to communicate with uh, the individuals kind of championing this product the process or uh, our product within their company. But working with an agent network is something we rely our distribution network to do. So we provide them with tools and resources that can be easily translated. Translate our app, which is geared towards agents, into local language as requested by our partners. And we've just now translated our software platform into French to help support our partners working in West Africa, who, you know, obviously even their office staff mostly speak and read French, not English. Okay. So you say you're in 15 countries. Mm -hmm. um, where are those based? Are they all in Africa? What's... No, not all in Africa. Uh, majority of our business comes from East and West Africa, uh, but we are also starting operations in Southeast Asia and have some partners in Latin America as well. And is it the same software that is used in all these places? It is. It's the same software platform and the Android application used in all of them. Has there had to be any customization for the Kenyan market? 
other than Spikey for the, the app, uh, not so much. I think what really changes between various markets, obviously beyond language, is product size and type. Uh, communication technology. So when I, you know, product size and type, uh, you know, you wouldn't want to enter the Nigerian market with a tiny lantern. Um, that's a market that would be a much larger system. People tend to be wealthier than some of the other countries, and in a lot of cases, the grid is not servicing people very well. So there are a lot of people with higher income that maybe wouldn't be the normal target market for a pay-as-you-go product who would purchase a solar product on credit for a larger system that could run a TV, a fan, maybe a fridge, and so on. So there's a ton of market segmentation by this you know, sort of product size and type, and then uh, market segmentation along the lines of the pay-as-you-go technology that you can utilize. So from before, we were talking about the fact that there's basically four major types of pay-as-you-go communication technology, cable, Bluetooth, key code and GSM. And all of those have varying requirements about connectivity. So for a GSM system, the home system would need to be in an area with connectivity for a software platform to connect to the product. Do you mean like internet connectivity? So not necessarily internet, uh, well, telecom communication essentially, but yes, also data. With Bluetooth and cable, because they're interacting with a product, a cable or a Bluetooth dongle and a cell phone, there needs to be both data connectivity and then uh, cell connectivity as well for use of those technologies. But because those are typically working with small lanterns, people can go to places with some sort of connectivity. So, you know, you can bring your small solar lantern to the market that has uh, cell phone range and then bring it home already topped up. And then the key code products don't require any connectivity for the actual product. You can enter a key code anytime, anywhere but you would need, at minimum, the ability to receive a key code by SMS uh, somewhere in a connected range to receive an SMS. Sure. So all of these technologies, just by their uh, need for connectivity, can change uh, what's most successful or what sells best. And then you have the additional piece of what does a traditional distribution network look like within these communities as well. So. With a Bluetooth technology and a cable technology, they require high touch by agents because every time you want to top up, regardless of whether you're using mobile money or cash, someone has to connect their cell phone with a cable or with the Bluetooth dongle to your product. So somewhere where there's existing large extended agent networks makes a ton of sense for that technology. Uh, whereas GSM or key code, if you're working in combination with mobile or money, require no hands-on work from an agent other than the initial sale and setup. So, so we'll just do a few more questions. That's all right. Why is it called Angaza? Uh, Angaza means enlightened in Swahili. And uh, Leslie and Tori and Brian, who are the co-founders of Angaza, wanted to feel close to their initial market, which was they started doing initial work in Tanzania. And uh, I think sort of connection there <laughs> between what we do and the word make a lot of sense as well. Cool. And, uh, and when, when you look over the next sort of six months to three years, what are you personally most excited about and Gaza? Yeah, I, I think it's a couple of different things. One, I'm super looking forward to the diversity in products that we're adding and uh, not just being pay as you go for solar lighting, but extending into other products uh, like cook stoves and solar water pumps. I'm also very excited about a new offering we have, which is to use our uh, software application and uh, sorry, our platform and our uh, Android app for distribution networks that aren't necessarily interested in lockout systems but are interested in monitoring their own credit. So, for example, maybe somebody is already distributing a water tank on credit, but water tanks are traditionally going to be turned on or off when somebody doesn't pay but there's still a ton of value in our platform tracking credit uh, on those, for those clients. Um, being able to see how somebody's paying, payment history, uh, an agent sale history, and so on through utilizing our two tools. And so uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing how we can work with some of these more non-traditional distributors to allow them to work with credit effectively using our platform and app. Yeah. Cool. And, and what, would, uh, what would make that easier? <laughs> What would make distributing credit easier? Yeah. Or, uh, well, I, I think it's our app and our platform. But I, I think for 
for anyone, it's the ability to sort of uh, understand somebody's credit in real time, helping to direct, um, especially if you're working through an agent network, agent work to understand how they should prioritize their time for collecting repayment and making sales. So I think a lot of it has to do with the data that we can collect through our system and being able to leverage that back into your operation to, you know, sort of sell more effectively and repay, get the right repayment strategy for your company. And uh, and how can people listening at home follow the story of Ankasa? Do you have on social media? What's the? <laughs> we do have a Facebook page and a Twitter handle, and you can also follow us at angaza.com. Awesome. Cool. Well, Lindsay, thanks so much. Thank you. Before we head, just a quick moment to say thank you for listening. You can see the show notes of this episode by heading to samfloor.com forward slash podcast and then searching for the episode title. That's S-A-M-F-L-O-Y dot com forward slash podcast. Now, a few people have got in touch and have been asking about how this podcast came about. And well, it all started when I took a one-way flight to Rwanda to seek out business opportunities across the region. I'm now at the stage of formulating a bit of a plan of the business I want to go into based on all of these podcast interviews, and we'll be keeping a record of what I get up to on my blog. And so if you're interested in being kept in the loop, you can sign up to the newsletter there. Again, it's samfloy.com. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback about the podcast, or indeed anything, please feel free to email me, podcast at samfloy.com, and I'd be very happy to chat. In any case, have a great week, and speak to you soon.